Most of us treat our TV set with more respect than we treat ourselves. For example, when our TV picture isn't quite in focus, when the vertical hold won't vertic and the horizontal hold won't hor is, what do we do? We find the right knob and we adjust the set, right? When your horizontal hold goes blip, 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 and you find yourself looking at the bottom of the screen to see the top of the picture and the top of the screen to see the bottom of the picture, you adjust the knob, right? You turn the knob so the picture goes blip, blip, stop. You don't turn the knob the other way so it gets worse and goes blip, 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 blip. Yet, 90% of the time with our own brain, that's exactly what we do. We turn the knob the wrong way and we spend our whole lives going blip, 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 blip. Now, our automatic success mechanism, or what the Freudians called the subconscious, is absolutely impersonal. It operates as a machine. Now, that's not to say that you are a machine. It is only to say that you have a machine which you can use and which has no will of its own. It always tries to react appropriately to our current beliefs and interpretations concerning environment. It always seeks to give us appropriate feelings and to accomplish the goals that we consciously decide upon. It works only upon the data which we feed it in the form of ideas, beliefs, interpretations and opinions. It is conscious thinking or the Einstein mode which is the control knob of our subconscious machine. What we put into our minds in the form of beliefs about ourselves and our world and our future through our conscious mind will come back out of our subconscious in the form of feelings and behavior. Doesn't it stand to reason, then, that our conscious perception of reality and ourselves is awfully important? Now, if you have ever failed at anything, anything at all, would you please raise your right hand? Go ahead. I, I know you'll feel silly, especially if there are other people around. But look at it this way. In previous cassettes, we've already had you strip naked, talk to mirrors, and scream at the top of your lungs. The people around you already think you're crazy. No sense disappointing them now. If you didn't raise your hand, would you please give me a call long distance, collect? It'll just take a minute. I have some water I'd like you to turn into wine. Now, please raise your left hand, too, if you have ever had a negative or bad experience, any kind of negative or bad experience at all. Please keep your hands up. If your hands are up, and if you have ever as a result of past failures or negative experiences, suffer the slightest tinge of self-doubt about your own abilities, however slight, would you please raise your left leg? Now, if you have your arms in the air and left leg in the air, please lift your right leg, too, if... Wait a minute. If you happen to be listening to this while driving your car, get your hands back on the wheel, and don't try raising your remaining leg unless you are already sitting down. I know that sounds awfully basic, but you never know about some people. They may be the kind of person where, if you were laying sod, you'd have to follow right behind them saying, green side up, green side up. Okay, lift your right leg too, if you have ever allowed that tinge of self-doubt to affect your behavior in any minute way. At this very moment, every honest person listening to this cassette ought to have both arms and both legs in the air. And where does that leave us? Where does that vile combination of past failures, negative experiences, self-doubt, and tainted behavior leave us? Why, it leaves us on our butts, doesn't it? It's a simple formula. The good Lord gave us one head to think with and one tail to sit on. Heads you win, tails you lose. Wait, don't put your arms and legs down yet. Thought we were through, didn't you? We're not. Get them up. Oh, this feeling of power. Now, if you can truly and honestly and legitimately come to the conclusion now that just because you failed at something in the past, you're not a failure today, that just because you had a negative experience in the past does not make the present a negative day, that there are more things in your present condition to support feelings of self-confidence than there are things in your past to support feelings of self-doubt, and that your actions of today should logically be based upon the reality of today and not upon the musty, dusty old data of past failures and bad experiences, if you believe that, you can put your arms and legs down.
But if you don't, you might as well stay on your butt because mentally, that's where you've been for a long, long time. We turn the knob of our conscious mind the wrong way. Don't be a walking blip. Don't turn that knob in the direction of the past. Tune in on today and let your actions of tomorrow and the next day be based upon your purposeful, positive perception of now. In computer terminology, the acronym GIGO, G-I-G-O, stands for Garbage In, Garbage Out. What it means, of course, is that if you feed a computer with all the wrong data, then, when you ask it a question, all you'll get is a wrong answer. What is the weakest link in any computer programming system? The computer programmer, of course. If the programmer's perception of reality is incorrect, then his or her translation of the data will also be incorrect. Hence, the data fed to the computer will be incorrect and the feedback obtained from the computer when called upon to solve a problem will be incorrect. Likewise, if our personal programmer, the conscious mind or Einstein mode, incorrectly perceives data in the form of illogical or wrongly held beliefs or opinions, then its translation of that data will be incorrect. It will then feed incorrect data into our computer, the subconscious success mechanism, which in turn will provide us with 100% pure, unadulterated, certified garbage when it is called upon to solve a problem. That's why the most crucial element of the conscious mental process by which we sustain the vivid image of our goals must be that element which causes us to constantly evaluate and reevaluate our opinions and beliefs. Remember, we cannot sustain a mental image or a goal which is inconsistent with some deeply held belief. If we honestly believe we're a schlock, then we cannot sustain a mental image which says we're not a schlock. Bertrand Russell explained what we must do mentally each day to combat old misconceptions and inaccurate beliefs. He wrote, Do not be content with an alternation between moments of rationality and moments of irrationality. Look into the irrationality closely with the determination not to respect it and not to let it dominate you. Whenever it thrusts foolish thoughts or feelings into your consciousness, pull them up by the roots, examine them, and reject them. It is necessary that a person should think and feel deeply about what his reason tells him. Our first line of defense against selling ourselves short and our goals down the river is that complex coalition of reverberating nerve endings and synopses juxtaposed geometrically in such a manner as to facilitate the highest laws of physics and the most complicated of chemical and hormonal reactions otherwise known as horse sense. Evaluate. Don't vegetate. When from time to time you feel, as we all do, that for some reason what you dream just can't come true, use the good sense that God gave you. Find the cause of your conflict within that computer, examine it, and conquer it. If we launch our ship of dreams from the bedrock of character. If we bathe it in the ocean of disciplined motivation, if we steer our craft by the wheel of purposeful, positive perception, and if we chart our path along the course of constant evaluation, we will miss the port of men who might have been and reach the shore of success. The port of men who might have been lies just off has been Bill. And all the men who might have been are shabby, gray, and still. One missed a punch, one married wrong, ambition died in one, one loved the light, the light of nights, that blaze behind the sun. By gosh, it gives a man a chill to see them shabby, gray, and still. 
so many men who might have been in the port of has been bill the port of men who might have been is crowded to the doors and all the men who might have been are very dreadful bores their tales are old their tales are dry one trusted in a friend one lacked the part one lacked the heart to seek the rainbows and by gosh it gives a man the mopes to see them sitting there like dopes so many men who might have been in the port of busted hopes the port of men who might have been is east of used to be and all the men who might have been are carried passage free I've seen it pass their boats of glass and drift along the years with all the men who might have been past shoals of bitter sneers by gosh it makes a fellow sigh to see the good ship alibi with all those men who might have been and cargoes of career I told my friend that poem too. It brought a tear to his eye. He said, "That sounds a lot like me." I said, "No, you're a lot closer to the shore of success than you think. But there is a third ingredient to effective goal setting, the most important of all. We must relax and let the success mechanism that God gave us work for us." Well, Keith, you may say this stuff about a subconscious success mechanism, a computer fed by goals, is a little hard to take. Besides, you say, I get things done by concentrating with my conscious mind. I can't control my subconscious brain. I just sublease that space. It thinks what it wants. I don't know what's down there. I don't want to know. That guy in there might be crazy. Anyhow, that kind of thinking you're talking about, that kind of genius just applies to writers and poets and scientists who make great discoveries i run my business and my home and my life with my conscious mind wrong between your ears there rests at this moment a genius equal to or greater than the genius of the greatest minds that ever lived what's more you use it every day at home at the office wherever you go and what's more that genius comes to you not from concentrating with your conscious brain but by allowing your subconscious creative success mechanism to work for you and the more we relax and allow that success mechanism to do its thing the more genius we will display and the more goals we will attain ultimately it is not through concentrated conscious thought that things become a part of us it is through the effortless functions of our subconscious mechanism and it is there our genius begins we need only relax and let it work for us one of the commonest mistakes we make in this age of stress is to jam our gears by worrying too much of course we're going to worry we all have substantial responsibilities that require serious thought but we tend to worry too much especially about our own ability to succeed our ability to reach our goals at some point we must accept as an article of faith that we were not put on this earth to fail that we are all each of us fully equipped for success and that success is inevitable we are in short forced into a position of trust in ourselves conscious rational thought selects the goal gathers information concludes evaluates estimates and starts the wheels in motion but it was never engineered to solve problems that job belongs to our subconscious success mechanism and the more we worry about whether it will work the more we jam the gears and the less able it is to do the job for which it was intended mainly to help us reach our goals all of the scientific evidence points to the conclusion 
that in order to receive an inspiration or a hunch or that spark of genius, we must first of all be intensely interested in solving a particular problem. We must think about it consciously, gather all the information we can on the subject, consider all the possible courses of action, and above all, have a burning desire to find a solution. But after we have defined the problem, after we see in our imagination the desired end result, secured all the information and facts that we can, we've got to stop worrying. Continued worrying at that point does not help but actually hinders the final result. The French scientist Fur said nearly all of his best ideas came when he was not actively at work on a particular problem. He said his colleagues had all their best thoughts while away from their workbenches. Thomas Edison used to take short naps when stumped by a problem. Time and again the answers would come to him after a period of rest. After months of unfruitful conscious thought, Charles Darwin, while riding in a carriage, thought of the idea which became the foundation of his book, The Origin of Species. Lennox Riley Lohr, former president of NBC, said ideas came most readily to him while doing something that kept his mind alert while not putting too much strain on it. And C.G. Suits, former chief of research at General Electric, said that nearly all the discoveries in research laboratories came as hunches during a period of relaxation following a period of intensive thinking and fact-gathering. Yes, the creative success mechanism which will get us where we're going will work if we relax and let it work. But relaxing is not a relaxing matter. It's easier said than done. With all the pressures upon us, it's not always easy to push our worries aside and allow our success mechanism to help us reach our goals. So how do we do it? Try this four-step formula proposed by Dr. Maltz. It may help. First, as the gamblers say, do your worrying before you place your bet, not after the wheel starts turning. Once we decide upon a course of conduct, no constructive purpose whatsoever is served by worrying about the outcome. We should have enough faith in our own decision-making processes to follow through on what we decide and to let the rest take care of itself. In other words, relax. Second, work on worrying about today and only today. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow may never come. A worry is a thousand carbon copies of a single possibility. For tomorrow we must plan, but it is today we must enjoy. So concentrate on today and relax. Third, do one thing at a time. If in the back of our mind we're worried about the dozen projects we know we should be working on, we'll never be able to fully concentrate on the task at hand. And there's no need to feel badly because you can only do one thing at a time. That's all any of us can do. So do it and relax. Fourth, sleep on it. If you have a troublesome problem, don't go blind trying to solve it all at once. Don't fall asleep worrying about it. Instead, keep a pad of paper and a pencil next to your bed. You'll be amazed at the number of ideas you'll have and solutions you'll find the next morning after your success mechanism has had an uninterrupted night to work on your problem. So sleep on it and relax. Yes, we all possess great genius. What we think of as genius is nothing more than a natural process by which our mind works to solve any problem. But we mistakenly apply the term genius only when that process is used to write a book or paint a picture. We, each of us, has within us the greatest and most valuable gift ever presented to any species which ever existed the human brain. 
that brain is a precious tool which we must use to get us from where we are to where we're going, from someday to today, from tomorrow to now. We need only use that treasure between our ears to establish our goals and understand why their mere establishment, if maintained, will work. We need only use that gift to establish a conscious mental process by which to sustain our vivid image of our goals, and we need only relax and permit that tool to operate as the automatic success mechanism for which it was intended. And if we do these things, the genius within each of us will grow and flourish as never before, and we will reach our goals, and each day will be the brighter for us and for those whom we love and touch. And that's pretty much what I told my best friend. Now, I know he is no smarter today than he was when he and I spent that week together in that dingy little room at that motel. But he seems to be using what he has a whole lot more effectively now. I'm pleased and flattered that he took my advice. He established his goals and understood why their mere establishment, if maintained, will work. He adopted a conscious mental process by which to sustain his goals, and he relaxed and allowed his built-in success mechanism to work for him. He's made mistakes in the past, and certainly so have I. And I don't presume to have all the answers. I can't even be sure that what I told him will ultimately work. But it seems to be working now. My best friend no longer stays at that motel. Of course, he's rarely home either. He's too busy. He seems to get along very well with himself and the people around him. He's rapidly becoming a wealthy man in more ways than one. He's written books, he owns a publishing company, and he travels all over the world giving talks to great people like you about the importance of goals. You know, I am blessed with many good friends. But yes, my best friend is that fellow I see in the mirror each morning. That fellow I saw in that mirror, in that room, in that motel. And he and I had a long talk. And you know, somehow I suspect that every man and woman who will ever listen to this cassette, one way or another, at some time in their lives, has stayed at the Siesta Motel. But how long we stay and what we make of it is up to us. A lot of us check in and never leave. But I know you won't. For you have miles to go. People to meet. Great goals to accomplish. And great happiness to enjoy. And you are capable. Fully capable. Of achieving it all.